Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 23rd. First up, as some of you know, I've got this obsession with these quadcopter things, so anytime I see an article or something mentioning these things in the developments, it just captures my interest. And this one's particularly of interest. This is from a YouTube channel. This is the YouTube channel of Dario Brescianini, and he's part of this project. They're called Flying Machine, it's called the Flying Machine Arena Project, and what they do is they have two of these quadcopters coordinated so that they can balance a pole like a baton. Have you ever taken a, a broom and balanced it on the palm of your hand? Well, this uh, quadcopter can not only do that, they can toss this baton back and forth, and the other quadcopter can catch it and continue balancing it. Um, it's pretty amazing what really it's kind of scary to think about the fact that is if they're showing us this and this is what they can develop just with some people experimenting this with uh, they're from Switzerland I imagine what is uh, DARPA accomplishing with a fleet of uh, maybe 20 or 30 of them because I have this feeling that the science that we don't see is always about 10 years ahead of what we are able to see so if this is what they can accomplish just with two of these little quadcopters imagine what some kind of a defense related project or a military related project is doing with 20 or 30 of these things it would it would probably be scary to even think of so if you get a chance I'll put the link down below to as usual to all the articles but I'll put the link to this YouTube video and you will be rather amazed I had to look at it several times because when I first saw this I thought is this fake or is this real but I am pretty much convinced now that this is real you could probably go to the place and actually see them do it and so next up this is from iHealthBeat.org. the title is astronomy software could speed detection of cancer study finds this is a pet peeve of mine along with some others I will talk about in this week's show people talk about how science just for the sake of science is wasting money or research science is just wasting money I've been to places like Sandia National Laboratory and I signed in the guest register and besides that I'm kind of curious and I look through the guest register and I'll see these little comments people leave about research science about well you're wasting millions of dollars that could be used to help people in third world countries or could be helped uh, used to help starving families and then at Fermilab the same thing too well you're wasting millions of taxpayer dollars or millions of dollars that could be used to help other things well people don't realize that in the future these research things that did not necessarily have a direction did end up helping people and this one is specifically about astronomy software that could speed detection of cancer and what they're using is the same software that they detect differences in stars you can't really have a staff anymore it's just not affordable to have a staff of people look through photo plates or look through digital images and try to find stars that have differences so what you do is you have software with certain algorithms that actually look at the different stars and when they detect the difference you're looking for it actually gives you an alert well the same kind of software that does that for stars they found out can do that with stained cancer cells and they said by trying this out it actually has as good of a rate as a human manually looking at it so could you imagine the time that it takes to look through all these scans of cancer cells to be our yeah cancer cells to detect our, our hum I shouldn't I got that wrong it's human cells to detect cancer cells within the human cells and so what they do right now is for the new study researchers from the Cancer Research Institute UK Cambridge Institute and the University of Cambridge adapted the astronomy algorithms for biology to detect variances in tumor cell staining so that uh, well I was right actually in the first part when I said that it was actually variances in cancer cell I thought it was to pick out cancer cells but it's actually variances within the cancer cells so anyway just to kind of show that these things when you start out in a direction they can lead in very much unknown directions for example in Fermilabs they uh, use the proton beam that they produce in one of the accelerators now to fight another type of cancer so you know you've got to invest money even where you don't really know where it's going to lead you got to invest money just in pure science and research it always does some good and next up this was sent by one of my regular contributors and I cannot for the life of me remember which one of the three or four it was so if you uh, are the one that sent this to me let me know down in the comments below and uh, tell me who you are and then I will put it up there as credit if, if, if it's important to you um, but anyway too much coca-cola killed a mom and this is out of New Zealand Invercargill evidently this lady drank 10 liters of coca-cola every day and finally by the time she was 30 years old I guess it had its effect with the overdose of caffeine and sugar and everything like that they said as a matter of fact she didn't even have any teeth left and uh, 
Yeah, that much coke and everything like that, and the racing heartbeats of the coroner determined the only effect he could really see that eventually did kill her was just the overconsumption of coke. So if you get a chance to read this article, uh, and that gets me into my other pet peeve about um, nutrition and uh, people going crazy over these new uh, GMO corn and other GMO products. I mean, I'm not saying that's something to not be concerned at all, but you've got to kind of put things in perspective. If you look at the average American diet and probably the average first world country diet, including like Canada, Europe, and places like that that are developed countries, for the most part, people eat a total garbage diet. I mean, to be so concerned about that you might have some GMO product and whatever you're buying and stuff like that, and yet to eat the kind of diet that the average person eats in a first world country to where you put garbage fast food in your body, you put all kinds of candy, snacks, stuff like that. Um, if you ever see a vegetable on your plate, it's probably the garnish on your steak meal or something like that. Um, we've got to concentrate and put these things in the proper perspective with nutrition. I would say if you had no other care other than just to walk into a supermarket on a regular basis and buy enough fruits and vegetables to where you had at least five servings of fruits and vegetables in your weekly diet, your health would improve probably so much compared to your to the average American that the concern about GMO and labeling and stuff like that would be secondary. Now, I don't object to the fact of truth in labeling. Sure, absolutely. I, if something is genetically modified in some way, but let's even look at that. Let's look in the case of corn and genetically modified. I don't think anybody, unless they're older than me, has probably even ate such a thing as corn, that at least the majority of you. I mean, maybe some people are gardeners or whatever, but it's very unlikely that you have not consumed the majority of genetically modified corn anyway in your lifetime. It was around 1958 that the hybrids were started to be developed, and in fact, um, the center of that is a place I went to school in DeKalb, Illinois, Northern Illinois University. Well, DeKalb was also noticed, noted for the first place that hybrid corn was developed and how they did that was by genetically modifying it. They actually strung together more genes so that they could get more production out of the crops. But let's even go back beyond that. Let's go a thousand years before that and you think, well, when agriculture was still um, in its infancy and people were producing crops, what did you usually do after you produced your crops? Well, you saved the seed from that crop, but you made selections from that seed you actually went through your field and the typical thing to do was to find the plants that were the tallest, the plants that were the healthiest, the plants that produced the most corn. And then you would take those plants, save the seed from it. So the thing you were genetically modifying your field of corn was is for better production next year. You were not modifying the corn to be more healthy. You were not modifying the corn to be more nutritious. You were not modifying the corn to be more disease resistant. All you were modifying by your picking of certain seeds was for the plants to produce more corn. And that was the only thing you were actually, there was no way back a thousand years ago you could test to see what was the nutritional value. You couldn't test to see how disease resistant it was. So we have, my argument is we have basically been genetically modifying not only corn, but any crop we've been growing for over a thousand years, we have been genetically modifying it by our choice of what we pick it for. It's the characteristic we pick it for is the only thing that's going to change. Now let me share with you a couple of concerns I do have about the genetically modified organisms such as corn. It's the fact that they are trademarking and making these crops so that you cannot even rep you have to actually sign an agreement when you buy the seeds that you can't even replant your own crops. So they're making that to where um, you know they're going to just limit people being able to produce their own food on their own. You're going to have to be forced to buy the seeds from them. They're making the seeds to where they self sterilize so that you won't even be able to even if you could. And the other thing about it, too, is they are making these things so that they are so pesticide resistant that they can actually spray three or four times the normal amount of pesticides to kill insects and, and things like that. Because if it's sprayed onto the food, um, they can't clean it off enough that you're going to get some in your diet, too. So I do not like the fact, too, that they're genetically modifying it to use so much chemicals that are actually harmful to living things. Because once you consume it, you're a living thing, too. So just to make it so that the bugs can't eat it, if it's strong enough to kill off bugs, it's going to be strong enough to do some kind of harm to us if we ingest too much of that. So that's two concerns I have with the genetically modified. Uh, I have no problem with truth in labeling. If uh, they want to tell exactly what the ingredients on the package and how it was produced, I think that's absolutely fine. But just don't think about the fact because you have a genetically modified organism that it's going to somehow you know, hurt you in comparison to, to what your diet is already. If your diet is totally garbage and you're not eating at least five servings of fruits and vegetables in your daily meal, probably take care of that first before you get really freaked out about the GMO stuff. And then after that, after you've got your diet corrected, then 
think about the GMO stuff. So anyway, that's about it for this week. I will probably get on another tear next week. And uh, I think besides that next week, I have a review with a buddy of mine. Uh, we have a piece of equipment we both purchased that uh, might be interesting for you guys to watch. So take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.